says When springtime comes, don't you? Instead of garden walks and ball games I get to work my weekends too How could I live without my LinkedIn? Hi guys, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, as you know, we normally have our meeting on the second Tuesday of the month. But since we uh, basically we have the pleasure of having Trevor uh, Loudon here, uh, we're probably going to, this is one of the reasons we're having the meeting early. Uh, but before we go on, I'm actually going to introduce you to uh, one of our co-organizers now. And his name is Jim Morose. I finally got it right. And I guess you guys already know him as the guy behind the camera, but he's going to have to do a lot more than just hold the camera from now on. Jim? Yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Jim, and I try to organize these things, but basically, you know, we got to get some critical mass. And, and uh, you know, we're just talking to the folks at home now, you know, for the show. But this is uh, this is our March meeting. It's 2012, March, what day is it? The 11th. 11th. And folks, you know, we have our monthly meetings, we put them on, you know, they're all on the website. Go to, you know, uh, northshoreteapotty.org and, and try to, you know, come and join us. Uh, we'd love to have you here. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, Should we shut the door? Yeah, we will. Uh, next meeting is going to be on the second Tuesday of the month. That'll be just before the April 15th uh, rally in Boston. Uh, the Mass Tea Party Coalition is actually going to be hosting. Uh, we will have a, a guest speaker. Uh, we'll, we'll announce who the guest speaker will be by uh, same time next week uh, for our next month, monthly meeting. And we are going to be actually meeting to organize uh, a committee to actually work on mainly setting up to organize certain things uh, regarding to the membership committee and so forth. Um, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do Trevor Lawton. Uh, you guys already heard of him. He's the guy that wrote the book uh, Obama and the Enemies Within. Uh, and Trevor from New Zealand. Trevor, sure. yeah. thank you. Okay. Go ahead. So I think. I think you want to read it. I don't know. Yeah, the mic to it. The mic's a lot better. You know. Quite no. Okay, so. Doing good, sir. How are you, folks? Can everybody hear? Because it's a comedy club, Carlos said I had to tell some funny stories to start. I come from New Zealand and a lot of people think we're Australian and they don't know the difference. But that's a grave, grave insult. If you call a New Zealander an Australian, that's like, that's like terrible. You know? 
And we always know there's a lot of people who move from Australia to New Zealand, but we're happy about that because that means the average IQ goes up in both countries. <laughs> that one out. I was in Los Angeles and um, I went to a little stall and the guy served me some food and he noticed my accent and he said, oh, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm from New Zealand. And he looked very blank. And I said, well, it's, it's down by Australia. He said, oh, Australia, where Arnold comes from. <laughs> so, um, look, I'm here today as a guest of the Tea Party, and I'm glad to be here in the cradle of the, of the American Revolution, and hopefully the cradle of the second American Revolution. One that is long overdue and is very much needed for this country to survive. And a lot of people ask me why, as a New Zealander, I should care about the internal politics of this country. And the answer is, there's two answers. The first one is simple gratitude. And that my country is only free because of the sacrifice of, <coughs> the sacrifice of US servicemen, the huge sacrifice in the battles of the Coral Sea, the Guadalcanal, Canal, and Midway in World War II. Without that huge loss of life, my country would have been subjugated by the Japanese. And, you know, so I'm very grateful for that, as are many, many New Zealanders. The second reason is related, but it's a little more selfish. Ronald Reagan had it right. You know, America is the last best hope for mankind. If freedom falls in this country, it falls everywhere. No, the North, if, if America loses its military superiority and goes down the tubes economically, the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and the Cubans and the Venezuelans and the Nicaraguans and the North Koreans and all their allies will basically carve up this planet amongst themselves. And I live in New Zealand at the bottom of the South Pacific and a thousand miles to the north of us, the Chinese have basically taken over Fiji. So they're in our area, they're all through the South Pacific, and I know that the day the US Navy stops patrolling the South Pacific, that's the day my country becomes a Chinese vassal state. So that's not enthralling to me, that's not exciting. So I've got a very powerful vested interest in your country maintaining its strength, maintaining its leadership role, and maintaining its military superiority. And that can only be done with a sound economy and a populace willing to back their military. So today I want to talk about a subject that isn't talked about much these days, and that's, that's communism. And I want to talk about the central secret of communism. And that is not atom bomb spies or labor union agitators or rock throwers in the streets. It's about the ability of a tiny Marxist party to get their policies adopted as the law of the land in a target country. Okay, so it means basically the French Communist Party can get communist policies through the French Parliament. The tiny Australian Communist Party can get their policies through the, through the Australian Parliament. And in the United States, it means the Communist Party USA and Democratic Socialists of America being able to get their policies through the, your House of Congress, through your Senate, and signed off by your president. Now that might seem very far-fetched, okay? To some people it does. But I'd like to give some examples of how this process works. It's a cut-out process. So, how it works, we'll go back to New Zealand. In my country in 1984, we elected a socialist Labour government. One of the very first things that government did was to enact anti was to basically pass a law banning nuclear warships from our harbours. That had the effect of destroying an, a, a very long time Australia, New Zealand, United States military alliance. Because American ships couldn't come to our ports, therefore the alliance collapsed. And that was right at the time where Reagan was fighting for Star Wars, where um, there were massive anti-nuclear marches throughout Europe, and, and, and Reagan was fighting communism, the, contra, the uh, Sandinistas in Nicaragua. It was a key time in the, in the, a key time 
in the Cold War and my country opted out and pulled out of the Western Alliance. And that was sold to New Zealanders as a patriotic move. You know, we were we were an independent country standing up to the to the Yank, you know, Yanks, standing up to American imperialism and opting out of the nuclear arms race. We were not going to have any dirty nukes in our clean, pristine harbours. And that is so much part of New Zealand culture today that even our Conservative governments don't dare to touch it. It's ingrained, it's part of our psyche now. So that's, but how did that happen? In 19, well, in the late 80s, I interviewed a New, Zealand, a New Zealander who had infiltrated the New Zealand Communist Party for our security intelligence services. And in 1983, he was so high up in the party, he was chosen to go to Moscow and train at Lenin's Institute for Higher Learning on Lenin Brodsky Prospect. This was a huge communist training school for cadre worldwide. There were 7,000 students there, some of them on seven year courses, some of them on one to one tutelage. So there were Danes there, there were Libyans, there were Egyptians, there were Koreans, there were Australians, there were Taiwanese, Japanese, Colombians, Nicaraguans, Chileans, Mexicans, you name it. There was every country of the globe virtually, except for one, the main enemy, the United States of America. So why were there no Americans there? Because at one stage, your government had told the Soviets that had any Americans been caught training at that institute, there would be war. And the Soviets respected that, but what they used to do, they would get the doctrine and they would indoctrinate some Mexicans or Canadians or New Zealanders or Australians, then they would go and train the American communists. So they got around it. So that is one example of how this works. Now, I'd like to pick in a couple of examples from the United States of America. Well, well that, that basically, I'll, I'll backtrack. My friend sat in Moscow with the KGB, with the Soviet people, Soviet um, professors and that at the Institute, and they worked out they wanted to take one country out of the Western Alliance in the hope that it would spread to other countries that it would lead to the breakup of NATO. So they picked New Zealand because we were small and liberal, the communists were strong there, they controlled the Federation of Labour and they had a lot of infiltrators inside the New Zealand Labour Party. So they worked it all out, they worked the psychology of it all out and how they could sell it as a patriotic measure and how they could get the Kiwis to think it was all their own idea. And so these communists went back to New Zealand and using their peace movement contacts the control of the Federation of Labour and the infiltrators in the Labour Party, they got that passed within a few short months. And that destroyed a military alliance at a very crucial time. And not one, I can tell you right now, not one New Zealander in 100,000 would have any idea of the origins of that policy. You ask any Kiwi about the anti-nuclear stand and they'll put their hands on their heart and say that was our idea, we thought of it and we're proud of it. They have no idea that it was pushed on them in an underhand manner by the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War. So I'll give an example of this happening in, the, in this country. I'll start with a very small symbolic example. Out in California, every year they have what they call a Cesar Chavez holiday. You get a day off in honour of Cesar Chavez. The Chavez was the founder of the United Farm Workers, a labour union agitator, trained by Saul Alinsky in his work, and his slogan, his famous slogan, was Cesa Puede, yes we can. Familiar? Should be. You can see where Barack Obama got it from. But Cesar Chavez worked with the Communists and the Socialists. But the woman who got that holiday enacted into law was Evelina Alacon of the Cesar Chavez holiday campaign. And she used all her contacts in the California State Legislature. She enlisted a whole lot of left-wing movie stars and a whole lot of Southern California Labor Union guys. And she got that bill pushed through. 
Evelina Alacon is the leader of the Southern California Communist Party USA. She is now trying to get that adopted on a nationwide basis. And her website proudly proclaims the endorsement of one Barack Obama. <clears throat> Evelina Alacon even went to a meeting like this in Los Angeles in 2008, where she gave a great big um, Cesar Chavez poster to Maya Satoru Ning, the sister of Barack Obama, and used that as a big photo op for her campaign. But I'll talk about a more significant example, and one that will touch the hearts of some people in this state, and that's Obamacare. One sixth of the US economy stands to be socialised. Now it's not single payer socialist medicine yet, but we all know which direction it's heading in. And we know where the labour unions, etc. want to push it. But the father of single payer socialised healthcare in this country is a guy called Quentin Young. He's a medical doctor out of Chicago, a long-term activist. He's set up numerous front groups over the years, a whole bunch of alliances. He's campaigned relentlessly for single payer for 40 years. He's worked with John Conyers and others of your Congress to get single payer legislation put on the floor of your Congress for many, many years. Always defeated, but they kept coming back. And in 2008, when Barack Obama was in power, then they started to make progress, and you've got what you've got today. Quentin Young was the personal physician of Barack Obama. He openly takes credit for indoctrinating Obama into the ideas of socialist medicine. But more than that, Quentin Young was a 40-year veteran of the Communist Party USA before he left that organisation to join Democratic Socialists of America which is very, very powerful in Chicago and in this state. So don't ever tell me, don't, e don't ever tell me that one man can't change the world or can't change the country. These small groups of dedicated Marxists can alter the direction of your country and you guys think the Democrats do it. But who elects the Democrats? This country, the labour unions are all controlled now, the key labour unions are all controlled by Democratic Socialists of America and to some degree the Communist Party USA. So the Democrats have to go to them to get the troops and the money to get elected. And he who pays the piper calls the tune. So if you're elected by the Communist controlled trade unions, you follow their policy. So therefore, the Communists set the policy, the unions push it on the Democrats, and the Democrats push it through the floor of the Congress. And that's how it works. So, a lot of people say that, you go to Barack Obama, a lot of people say that Barack Obama made a great movement. But the truth is that a great movement made Barack Obama. And that movement really got underway in Chicago in the 1950s when the Communist Party USA and the Socialists joined forces to take on the daily machine in Chicago, the corrupt Democrat daily machine. So they joined up, they got on board with the black population of South Chicago and the Latino population and the labor unions and formed a big coalition. Now, does any of that sound familiar at all? You know, does any of that sort of resonate in today's times? So the very first person they got elected was Leon Dupre to the Chicago City Council. Dupre used to go to rifle ranges back in the 1920s with Saul Alinsky, where they used to practice shooting for the communist revolution they knew was around the corner. In the 1940s, Leon, Leon Dupre went down to Mexico carrying messages from US Trotskyists down to Trotsky, who was then living in Mexico City under exile from Stalin. So then in 1983, they had a big success. They got Harold Washington elected as the mayor of Chicago. Now Washington was a very uh, uh, an ultra-leftist, very closely connected to both Communist Party USA and Democratic Socialists of America. And they got him elected and he appointed, appointed dozens if not hundreds of communists and socialists to his administration. So then 1992, they got Carol Mosley Brown, another far leftist elected to the US Senate. 
Then they got Barack Obama elected to the Illinois State Senate. Then they got him elected to the Senate from Illinois. And then using their contacts and their movement nationwide, they got him into the White House in 2008. And he who pays, as I say, he who pays the pipe calls the tune, and he is fulfilling the agenda he was put there to fulfill. And that is the Marxist socialist agenda. So, you know, this is not an uncommon phenomenon. Like, like the left has always picked out promising young activists, quite often black or Latino, and using the labor unions, the black churches, their influence in the social movements, they get these people elected to positions of power in state legislatures, Congress, the Senate, etc. So they can then enact pushed socialist policy. But one good example of this would be Andrew Young, who was the US UN ambassador to the United Nations. Another good example would be Antonio Villagrosa, the current mayor of Los Angeles, an Alinsky trained guy, um, used to go to Cuba to pick sugar cane for Castro, etc. Um, a long term Communist Party connections, and was chosen by Obama for his transition team in 2008. So, we go back to Obama. Why, why is Barack Obama like he is? You know, what formed Obama's views? What formed his world view? The very first significant mentor to Barack Obama was Frank Marshall Davis. Now, Frank Marshall Davis, a black guy, was a Communist Party member in Chicago in the 1940s. He was a poet, journalist, and a writer. Very well up in the left art scene of the time. Very well thought of part of the sort of left-wing literati at the time. <clears throat> but in 1948, he left all that behind and he and his wife moved out to the little backwater of Hawaii, which was a real backwater at the time. And why would he do that? Because at the time, the communists were under direct, the US communists had been told by Stalin to move as many comrades as they could out to the Hawaiian Islands to build up the party there because A, Pearl Harbor was there and they wanted as many spies on the island as they could. They wanted to agitate for the removal of Pearl Harbor, so they wanted lots of agitators. And they're also anticipating Hawaiian statehood because they knew that once Hawaii became a state, if they could take over the local Democrat party, they would be guaranteed two more left-wing senators and you'll see it forever but plus a bunch a whole bunch of left-wing congressmen so they could tilt your country to the left that is exactly why the left the hard left has been promoting for many years now the dc state of movement and it continues to support the Puerto Rican state of movement today because it's all about demographics it's about getting more democrats in the Senate and less Republicans so they can shift the balance of this country permanently to the left. So out of Hawaii, um, Frank Marshall Davis, he starts working for the Honolulu Record, a labor union publication. His boss, the editor, was Koji Ariyoshi. Ariyoshi was a party member. He had worked in China during World War II with the US Army working with, Chuck, with Mao Zedong's communist forces. After the war, he traveled to New York, where he was active in the, with the Amerasia magazine people. Now, this was a magazine mainly staffed by communists, a lot of them Soviet agents, who worked with, tried to influence the US State Department to turn US foreign policy away from Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists and towards the Chinese communists. And they succeeded in that and delivered 500 million Chinese to Mao Zedong's forces. So, in Hawaii, Frank Marshall Davis, he joined the Democrat Party, as all the communists did. But he also had a hobby. Um, the FBI, who was watching him all the time, used to see him going out, photographing obscure beaches and hills and geographical features all around the Hawaiian Islands. And they drew a conclusion from that. And they had him on the security index, which meant that had war ever broken out with the Soviet Union, he would have been marked for arrest that day. Now, not all Communist Party members were on that index, 
only the ones the FBI considered the most dangerous and most influential. So that was Frank Marshall Davis. So Davis met Obama about 1970 when Obama was 10 and mentored him right through till he was about 19. A lot of people say, well, you know, by that time, you know, Frank Marshall Davis, he left all the left-wing stuff behind him. He was just a dope-smoking old alcoholic. You know, he was hardly a threat. But Frank Marshall Davis, as late as 1979, was still listed as an endorser of the American Committee for the Protection of Foreign Born, which was the leading Communist Party USA front of the day. So there's no evidence at all that Frank Marshall Davis ever stopped being read. So Obama leaves Frank Marshall Davis. He goes to Occidental College in, in, in Los Angeles, where he mixed with the Democratic Socialists of America people there and Tom Hayden's radical crowd. Then he went out to um, then he went to Columbia University in New York. There he attended at least one and possibly two of the annual Socialist Scholars Conferences that were then held at New York University or Cooper Union. And they were big gatherings, so organized by Democratic Socialists of America. Two or three thousand Marxist radicals, black power activists, radical feminists, gay activists, whatever, two or three thousand people sitting in a big hall plotting to bring your country down. And Barack Obama was right in the midst of it. So he leaves there and goes out to Chicago. The reason he went to Chicago was because of the election of, of Harold Washington, the left-wing mayor. He even applied for a job in Washington's administration. He didn't get that, but he did go out, worked as a community organiser for a few years, went to Harvard, came back, and set his sights on a political career. Now, the woman who gave Barack Obama his start in Chicago and Illinois politics was one Alice Palmer. She was an Illinois state senator who decided to run for Congress. And her idea was, I'll go for Congress, and Barack, you can have my Illinois Senate seat. So she took Barack Obama around the traps, introduced him to all the people he needed to know, she was the one who took Obama to the famous meeting in the drawing room of Bill Ears and Bernadine Dawn, the terrorist where the underground leaders. Quentin Young was there as well, where he was basically introduced to the Hyde Park left, the people who had started this movement many decades before. But Alice Palmer had a, had a history herself. In 1979, in 1980, she was invited, and I have the invitation cards, to the first anniversary of the Grenadan Marxist Revolution, Marxist Leninist Revolution. She was invited by Morris Bishop himself, the leader of the island. He was later killed by his communist brethren, and it was after that that Ronald Reagan invite, invaded the island and kicked the communists out. But she was invited there along with her husband. In 1983, she went to Prague, Czechoslovakia where she attended a meeting of the Communist Front, Soviet Front World Peace Council. She was also a leader of the US Peace Council. She served on its executive with people like Barbara Lee, who is now a congresswoman from California. And that was a front for the Communist Party USA. In 1985, she took 16 black journalists to the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia and East Germany. In Czechoslovakia, they met with officials of the Czech Foreign Affairs Department and discussed issues to do with America. She was at that time the leader, the head of what they called the Black Press Institute, based out of Chicago. That was a network of black journalists all over the United States, virtually all communists, whose job was to spread Soviet disinformation and communist propaganda amongst this country's black population. In 1986, Alice Palmer went to the Soviet Union, to Moscow, to cover that year's annual conference of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. The same year, she became the president, the international president, of the International Organization of Journalists. Now that was a bona fide Soviet front, run by the Soviet Union to influence journalists around the world. It was run by communist journalists. And, and Alice Palmer's job was to monitor activities in Canada, the United States, Mexico and the Caribbean. 
But another part of their job was to implement what they called their new information order, which was basically had to do with what they called issues of media fairness, as in fear, you know. Now, who remembers the fairness doctrine in the United States? Okay. It was abolished by Reagan. It was the idea that if you had a radio station and you put a, liberal, you put a conservative talkback host on, you had to give equal time to a liberal. Okay? Because the left didn't consider it fair that a conservative could attract sponsorship and an audience while a liberal got no listenership and no money. That was unjust. So they had to, to be fair, you guys had to subsidise the liberal, which made talkback uneconomic. And it was only when Reagan abolished that, that talkback flowered, the conservative talkback flowered. And you got the Rush Limbos and the Sean Hannity's, whatever, and you've got the movement you have today. And that is why, you know, I asked you to consider where that fairness doctrine may have originated from. And that is why Barack Obama wants to reintroduce some form of the fairness doctrine today and extend it to the internet. Because he wants to shut conservative voices down. It's not fair that you guys should have your voice when nobody listens to the Liberals. You know, it's as if it's it's there's not enough Liberal media in this country now. You know? So that was Alice Palmer. Alice Palmer was an effectively a high-level Soviet operative. And she got your president his first job in politics. So we're going out to the people around Obama. You know, you're judged by the company you keep. And I'm very proud to be judged by this company, I must say. And I really am. But we look at two people. The first is Valerie Jarrett, the other half of Obama's brain. Now, Valerie Jarrett introduced Obama to his wife. She was fundraised for him guided his career, and she sits in the White House now with the ear of the President at every, all the time. She's his closest friend and advisor. There's no question of that. But Valerie Jarrett has a bit of a family history as well. Her mother is Barbara Bowman out of Chicago. Barbara Bowman runs the Erickson Institute, a child psychology institute, which has had a lot of influence on early childhood education in this country. In 2009, President Obama gave her an award for her work, and that was, ceremony was prominently featured in the Communist Party USA's People's World. Eric Erickson, who the Institute is named after, was an errant disciple of Sigmund Freud. He's the guy that's the, that coined the phrase identity crisis. In the 1940s, he was expelled, he was kicked out of Berkeley University, because he refused to sign an anti-communist loyalty oath. He was also a lecturer at the California Labor School, the Communist Party USA's trade union school at the time. On the board of the Erickson Institute have served Tom Ears, the father of Bill Ears, and Bernadine Dawn, the wife of Bill Ears, and a famous terrorist in her own right. We go to the other side of the um, of the Jarrett household. Her late father-in-law was one Vernon Jarrett. He was a black journalist, very prominent journalist in Chicago. The last thing he did when he was dying of cancer in 2004 was to issue a call from his deathbed for the black population of Chicago to get out and vote for Barack Obama in that year's primaries. He was a big Obama supporter. In 1946, way back, Vernon Jarrett served on the Illinois State Executive of American Youth for Democracy. A very noble sounding organisation, no doubt. But it wasn't the youth wing of the Democrat Party, it was the youth wing of the Communist Party USA. In 1948, Vernon Jarrett served on the publicity committee of the Packing House Workers Strike Committee. Packing House Workers were a communist controlled union they were on strike, and Vernon Jarrett was doing their publicity for him, for them. On serving with him on that publicity committee was Frank Marshall Davis. So isn't it interesting 
that those two people sitting up there in the White House today can trace their political lineage back to the Communist Party USA of Chicago in the 1940s. So on the other side, the other half of Obama's brain, and that doesn't leave a heck of a lot, you know, that's Mr. David Axelrod. Now Axelrod got Obama elected, there's no question of that. And he's now sitting in Chicago orchestrating Obama's 2012 election campaign. David Axelrod, his mother was Merrill Bennett. She was an advertising executive. She came up with the concept of focus groups, you know, where you, you go and sit in a room and you test a new toothpaste or a political slogan and they give you some free movie tickets or a $50 voucher or something. So that was her idea. But before she did that, she used to work for PM, which was a magazine based in, in New York. So-called liberal magazine, but half of the staff members were Communist Party USA members, including at least one, one known Soviet spy, the famous journalist IF or Izzy Stone, who later became involved with Democratic Socialists of America and wrote endorsement letters for one Bernie Sanders, your neighbouring senator. So, Merrill Bennett, that was her role. When David Raxelrod moved to Chicago to study political science in the 70s, he was picked up and mentored and trained and guided in his early career, they even got him his first job with the Chicago Tribune, I think it was, by two well-known Chicago journalists, Don Rose and David S. Cantor. Now, Cantor and Rose had a little publication in Hyde Park called the Hyde Park Kenwood Voices. It was basically the paper of the Hyde Park left. They carried articles about Quentin Young's trip to North Vietnam during the Vietnamese War, about his son Ethan's trip to, to Cuba to cut sugar cane for Castro. They had a regular column by, they covered the SDS riots in Chicago in 1968, backing the radicals. They had a regular column there by Abner Mikva, the local congressman, and they really featured his career and promoted his career. Abner Mikva was a long-serving Democrat out of Chicago, a very strong anti-gun activist, extremely strong on that point. In later years, he's become an open, an open advocate, an open supporter of Democratic Socialists of America. He was also, for many years, a mentor to Barack Obama, and another person you will all know, and that's Yelena Kagan, who now serves on your Supreme Court. So, this little partnership, Don Rose and David Cantor. Don Rose was a communist frontist since the 1940s. His Chicago Red Squad file, his police file, des described him as a dangerous anarchist. He was an activist. He was a leader, one of the top officials of the Chicago Committee to defend the Chicago Committee to, for the Defense of the Bill of Rights, where he served with Quentin Young, the leading Communist Party front of that of the time. The other half of the partnership, David S. Cantor. He says he has Massachusetts roots. He was born here. His father, Harry Cantor, was the leader of the Massachusetts Communist Party during the 1930s. He was jailed for sedition. When he, when he caused some, uh, when he slandered the governor, I think it was, over the Sacco Vanzetti case, when two Italian anarchists were executed for murder. So after getting out of jail, Harry Cantor took the whole family, including baby David, to, to the Soviet Union where they lived in Stalin's paradise for many years. But by 1948, David Cantor and Harry were back in Chicago, were in Chicago and David Cantor was running the student newspaper at Chicago, at the University of Chicago, in Chicago Maroon. He was also an active member of the Communist Party at the time. Fast forward to 1960, and David Cantor, still a communist, is working with Leroy Wallens, a part, another party member, running a little, little organisation out of Chicago called Trans World Publications. The Trans World Publications was basically their job was to distribute Soviet literature all over the United States. And they were paid a subsidy by the Soviet Embassy out of Washington DC to do that job. 
Lee Rollins and Canton were both required to register as agents of a foreign power for their work. Go forward to 1964, the general election that year. Who remembers Barry Goldwater? You heard you? Okay. Well, Barry Goldwater fought the 1964 elections. He was a real strong conservative, a real strong patriot, a very strong anti-communist. And had he beaten Lyndon Johnson that year, we wouldn't have had the Great Society, which was a great advance in socialism. We probably wouldn't have had a lot of disruption in the 60s that this country had to go through. But he didn't win. And part of the reason he didn't win is because he was vilified very heavily as a fascist, a racist, and an extremist. Are any of those terms familiar to any people in this room? At all? No, no, no. No, you, you must belong to another tea party. Yeah. Okay. There was a focus group about that. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> but you know, those words are tried and true. They've been used for a long time. But what I'm going to tell you is one of the main sources of the anti Goldwater propaganda was trans world publications out of Chicago. So David Axelrod the man who wants to get your personal back in the White House, was trained and mentored in his early days by a Soviet-paid professional black propagandist. So maybe that's where he learned some of his tricks from. So that brings me to what I consider is the main agenda of the left. Now what do they want to do to your country? Now why do they get up every day, go to the union offices and march on the streets, and agitate and you know lobby your state legislatures legislators why do they do it what's their goal to get rid of the constitution well that's certainly part of it that's that's a big part of it but i'll tell you why i think what the real end goal is and it's not to make this country like france i can tell you that before i do it though i want to build up a little bit of credibility for an albuquerque high school math teacher named mark rudd now why would I want to do that? Mark Rudd was the brains of the, terror, of the terrorist weather underground. He was right up there, he was in the leadership with Bill and Bernie, and Jeff Jones, etc. One of the top people. He led the famous riots at Columbia University in 1968. And in 1969 he was in Cuba, being trained under a KGB major. In 2006, Mark Rudd and Bill and Bernie and Angela Davis and Tom Hayden and Jeff Jones, another terrorist weather, weather underground leader who incidentally helped write Obama's stimulus package, got together with a whole bunch of radicals, ex SDSs, Communist Party members, Democratic Socialists of America leaders, and they set up a new organisation called Movement for a Democratic Society. Another one of those cool sounding names, right? MDS was the adult support group for the new SDS, which is now active on campuses all over this country. They are the people who created Mary Hell at the Republican Party convention in Minneapolis a few years ago. So MDS got together and in 2008, Tom Hayden and some other MDS leaders got together and set up another subsidiary organization called Progressives for Obama and Mark Rudd endorsed that organisation. So what I'm trying to say here is that Mark Rudd knows the left, he's been an integral part of it all his life, and he personally knows people who know Barack Obama. So when he predicts Obama's agenda and says what it's going to be, well before the fact, I give him some credibility. Because he's in there, he knows. So 2008, just in November 2008, just after Obama was elected, he put a few conservatives into positions in the defence establishment. And a lot of people on our side of the fence went, wow, that's, that's cool, you know, maybe he's not such a, a bad guy, maybe he's not such a nutcase radical after all. Maybe he will be a moderate. But the left was spewing. They were not happy. How We got this guy elected, and how dare he put conservatives into the hated military industrial complex. So there was a lot of agitation on the left, a lot of ferment. 
and Mark Rudd had to calm the comrades down. He had to settle them down and get them back on with the agenda, get them back on board. So he wrote a little article for a thing called the Rag Blog out of, out of Austin, Texas. This was in November 28, 2008. It was entitled, Let's Get Smart About Obama. And the article was designed to get the comrades back on board. And I want to read some of what he wrote. And I do have to read from this because I can't remember it all. Okay. So, Obama is a very strategic thinker. He knew precisely what it would take to get elected and he didn't blow it. He knew he had to play to the centre to not be run over by the press or the Republicans or to scare centrist voters away. He made it. So he has a narrow... So he has a narrow mandate for change. The economic agenda will stress stimulation from the bottom at some times and handouts to the top at other times. Now how would, a, how would a Albuquerque economic high school math teacher know that? On foreign policy and the military and the use of foreign policy and the use of the military, there will be no change at all. And never, never threaten the military budget. This will unite a huge majority of Congress against him. And I agree with the strategy. Anything else would invite sure defeat. The leave the military alone. They are way too powerful for now. By the second or third year of this recession, when stimulus is needed from the bottom, people may begin to discuss cutting the military budget. Now, where are we now, ladies and gentlemen? We're three years in. You're worried about your jobs, your mortgages, keeping your kids in college, paying your taxes, keeping yourselves afloat. And while you're doing that, what is Leon Panetta doing over at your Defence Department? Slashing your budget. Six percent of federal spending is taking almost a hundred percent of the cuts. Who stands to gain from that? Our enemies. Your enemies. Russia, China, Iran, <coughs> Venezuela, North Korea, Cuba. They have been agitating against your US military spending for decades. And now they've got someone in the White House and someone in the Defense Department and the Pentagon who is doing it for them. Who is doing exactly what they've wanted. Because your military is the only thing that has ever stood between them and world domination. So, Mark Rudd goes on to say, Obama plays basketball. I'm not much of an athlete, I barely know the game. But one thing I do know is that you have to be able to look like you're doing one thing, but do another. That's why all these conservative appointments are important. The strategy is to faint right, move left. Any other strategy invites sure defeat. So Mark Rudd is basically telling you people, or telling the comrades, that Obama scammed us, pretended to be a centrist to get into power, but his whole agenda is left, and he has got your military firmly in his sights. That is his main target. So forget all the stuff about economic recovery or whatever. They'll only do that to the extent it takes to get them elected. Because they want to bring your country, they want to bring your economy down to the point that your military budget is so badly affected that you will have no choice other than to be incorporated in some big United Nations world government or face the combined military might of your enemies. And if that comes to the, you know, if you go down that far, you sure you, you won't be able to defend your own homeland, let alone defend Israel or New Zealand or any of your other allies. And that is why I have a very, that is why, as a New Zealander, I have a very powerful vested interest in you guys turning this around, because this is where it's heading. They don't want to make you like France. They want to make you like Cuba.
Now that brings me to Leon Panetta. Voted in 100 to 0 through the US, US Senate. A very popular, affable man. The man who got Osama Bin Laden. But what is he, you know? He's, he's, he's had two, two years military experience, but he's a budget man. That's what he did in the White House. That's his expertise. He's a smiling face who can cut the maximum amount of your budget without ruffling the feathers of the Republicans or the public at large. That's why he's there. We go back in history. Leon Panetta was a congressman out of Santa Cruz for many years. Democrat. Goes without saying, of course. But the Democrat Party in Santa Cruz is not the Democrat Party of Kentucky or Iowa or you know, Nebraska, it is a far left, lunatic fringe, nutcase Democrat Party of Southern California. And Leon Panetta used to have Democratic Socialists of America members on his campaign committees. He used to work with DSA members like Adam Laird. He used to work in all the left wing causes of the day. He spent his time in Congress campaigning against Star Wars. Campaign against Star Wars, against Reagan's policies in Latin America, against, um, you know, he even, he even did things like he put tributes to Lucy Hasler, a well known Marxist activist in the Congressional Record. He campaigned with the Communist Party for the release from jail of Lenin Peltier. Lenin Peltier was a radical American Indian activist who murdered two FBI agents up in the Dakotas and Leon Panetta tried to get him out of jail. But Leon Panetta had a friend. The Panettas, Sylvia and Leon Panetta, were very close in Santa Cruz to Dorothy and Hugh de Lacey. The two couples had parties at each other's homes. They were very close, very close, close, close friendship for many years. And Mr. Panetta had a correspondence over all that time with, with Hugh de Lacey. They used to share letters, which I have, and those letters used to talk about how horrible Star Wars was, and how we needed to cut US military spending, and how Reagan was wrong to oppose communism in Latin America. Panetta even copied a Brookings Institution defense paper, which was not available for public consumption, but copied it and gave it to, to de Lacey. During that time, de Lacey was going down to Nicaragua where he visited the Sandinistas. He had also visited the Spanish Communist Party in Spain. But Hugh de Lacey had a history as well. Surprise, surprise. During the late 40s, de Lacey was a US congressman out of, out of Washington State, 1946 to 1948. And virtually all he did on the floor of the US Congress was to agitate for, the, for America to abandon Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists and throw their support to, Shang, to Mao Zedong's communists. And it's not surprising he did that because all the time he was a democratic congressman, he was also a secret member, card-carrying member of the Communist Party USA. And that's not me saying that, that's generally acknowledged historic fact. He wasn't the first in your Congress and he certainly wasn't the last. But you know, the devil looks after his own, and uh, he maintained that Communist Party membership at least till the late 60s, probably the early 70s, when he started hanging around with the Democratic Socialists of American people. But he got his reward for his work. In 1975, just before, just before he started the correspondence with Panetta, he was invited, well, a Stanford University, Stanford University academic named John Stuart Service helped arrange a month-long trip to communist China for de Lacey and his wife. Free, all expenses paid trip. And that was a reward basically for his work in the 40s. John Stewart, John Stewart Service was another member of the famous, was a famous, was a member of the Amarage Aspiring in Washington DC in the 40s. So it was old comrades. They'd known each other. De Lacey and Service had known each other from back from that times those times. So in China, 
you know, the De Lacy's go around, they visit the collective farms and the factories and all this kind of thing, and they, they watch the little kids wave the red flags and what, what you do. But they also had time to visit with two American expatriates living in China. One of them was Frank Koh. Now, Frank Ko was at that time working as a propagandist for the Communist Chinese government. He was a former member of the Amerasia Ring and the Silver Master spy ring, KGB spy ring from Washington of the 1940s. The other guy he met was Solomon Adler. Adler was also ex Amerasia, also ex Silver Master spy ring, and at that time was a serving advisor to the Chinese intelligence services a live Chinese spy. So back in, back in the States, De Lacy was also corresponding regularly with Don Wheeler, a Communist Party member out of Washington State, another member of the Silver Master Spyro. He was also corresponding with Victor, Perl corresponding with Victor Perlow out of um, Connecticut, now Victor Perl another member of the Silver Master Spyro. And incidentally, Victor Perlow's son and daughter-in-law, son Art Perlow and daughter-in-law Joel Fisherman, run the New Haven People's Centre, which is the Communist Party USA headquarters in New Haven, where Rosa DeLauro, the Democrat congressman, has an office. And Rosa and Joel Fishman are great friends. And Rosa DeLauro has a very close relationship with the, with the Connecticut Communist Party and is one of the high-ranking Democrats in your current Congress. So, De Lacy was also the West Coast agent for In These Times, which was a, a Marxist journal based in Chicago. And that was run by James Weinstein, a former Communist Party member, a founder of Democratic Socialists of America. James Weinstein, in 2002, he got together with Carl Davidson and Marilyn Katz, a couple of Marxists, and they set up a big peace rally, a big anti-Iraq war rally in Federal Plaza in Chicago. And that is where Barack Obama first appeared on the national stage as a vocal opponent of the Iraq war. That is where he made his name nationwide. So I repeat my claim. You know, a great a Barack Obama didn't make a movement. A movement made Barack Obama. And that movement has a lot of members whose allegiance does not lie with this country. So that is why this is not a, a, just an American issue. This is an international issue with international implications you know, for the fate of all of us. So I, I don't want you people to get too downcast and depressed by all that. You know. I see you're getting a little bit upset sometimes, man. <laughs> really a little bit. Because um, I want to say <coughs> why I'm here is because in 2008, the left thought they had a slam dunk. They had the House, they had the Senate, and they had the White House. And their agenda was ready to roll, and they were going to steamroll you guys into oblivion. But in 2009 and 2010, you and hundreds of thousands like you got up, rediscovered your constitution, got out in the streets, and you kicked the left so far up the backside, they're still seeing stars today. No? You blew them away. They didn't expect you, and you stalled their agenda. You stopped card check, you stopped cap and trade, you slowed down and watered down Obamacare. You just stalled their agenda and they have never forgiven you for that. But they don't know how to handle you. They think they don't see you out the streets so much so they think you've gone away. But right now, the Tea Party movement and people like you are getting into the state houses, into the school boards, the county commissions, all of these institutions and you are changing this country from the grassroots up. Now, this is 1773 of the Second American Revolution. And you think what it was like in those days. Most of the people at that time were either Tories or apathetic. It was a very small core of people 
who are empowered by a vision of what America could be like, and they went to war, a bunch of farmers and shopkeepers and lawyers and doctors took on the mightiest empire in the world at that time, and they beat them. You know, they beat them. And how miraculous is that? So, I talk to a lot of Tea Party folk, and a lot of them will say to me, you know, there's, there's not enough of us, and people won't listen, and it's hard work, and are we making any progress, and should I keep doing this? You know, it's tough. And it was tough for those guys, too. You know, they put their lives on the line. They put everything, <coughs> they, put everything they had on the line. They had no popular support. They put everything in their line, and they prevailed. And I want to say to you, you know, this don't underestimate the historic significance of what you're doing because you are starting a revolution that's going to reverberate for hundreds of years. And there are millions of people all over this planet watching what you guys do, rooting for you, and hoping, hoping that you'll be successful so that you can turn your country around so we can turn our countries around as well. And I'll tell you, <clears throat> in 200 years' time, there'll be history classes in America here. And there'll be kids who'll get up, and they'll say to the rest of their class, they'll say, did you know, I've done some study and research on this, did you know that my great-great-great-great-grandma and grandpa, they were in the Tea Party? No, they stood up for America in its darkest hour of need, and turn this country around, and that is why we are free today. This movement will be as significant as the American Revolution was at its time, and you are at the beginning of that phase, just like those people were back in 1773. So please keep the faith, you know, keep on powering on, because you've got the right ideas, you've got the right tactics, you've got a lot of public on your side, even if they won't declare it. And you can keep going back, you can keep on keeping on, and you will take this country back and turn it around. <coughs> and so, <coughs> I just want to say that because of what you guys are doing, I do what I do. And I'm so proud to be associated with the Tea Party movement and what you've achieved so far and what you're going to achieve. So I just want to say a heartfelt thanks for your work, and God bless America. So, any questions, folks? Yeah, that's great. Right. <laughs> Happy to say questions if you're not right. shell shocked or whatever. Someone like um, Pelosi. Nancy. Yes. Yeah, Nancy. Yeah. Is she, is she part of this, or is she just sort of a fellow traveler, or is she a total? Look, well, look, she's she's worth she's worth twenty million dollars, but she has she has been a very close associate of both Democratic Socialists of America and the Hallinan family out of San Francisco, which is a communist family. She worked with them. She worked with very close friends with Vivian Hallinan. Their whole family were Communist Party members. A lot of them then went to Democratic Socialists of America. So Nancy Pelosi has put tributes in the congressional record to communists like Carlton Goodlett. Um, she put a, a, record, uh, a tribute into Fred Rhodes, who was one of the main Alinskyite trainers behind Cesar Chavez, for instance. So she is very sympathetic to this movement. She was a leader of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which was basically set up by Democratic Socialists of America. So she is in it to the limit. There's no question. She is a hardcore leftist, her bank balance notwithstanding. So she's on the other side. There's no question of that. So when you're looking at the Tea Party, you're going to see a lot of very fragmented groups. I'm sure you've noticed that, that oftentimes can't get along. You're also going to find uh, that by and large, our education system has been taken over by the communists. 
you'll find 47 plus percent of the population pays no taxes. So when you're looking at it from our shoes, you know, we often hear, keep up the fight, keep up the fight. Beyond daunting, it, it's, you've got global entities that are funneling money around us. We're basically hanging in by our teeth. So the question is, what exactly do we do? First question. And second question. There are so many laws that are passed in this country that are, that are unconstitutional. It doesn't take a, a genius to, to read the Constitution and understand what it says. It takes a lawyer to screw it up. I will, I will say that. Um, when your congressman won't listen, when the courts are corrupt, where do we, the people, go? Well, that's a, that's a lot yeah, of questions. Yeah, that's sure. A lot of questions. But it is what I hear a lot. You know, and you've summarised the problems pretty well. I don't doubt anything you've said there. You've got all these things against you. America has been the main target of the left for decades. Yes. And while a lot of people were getting rich and happy through the Bush and Reagan years. The left, the, the 1960s left, the ones who failed to destroy your country then, have been burrowing away through the labour unions, the education system, the media, and whatever. And when they got Obama in the White House in 2008, <coughs> their agenda was ready to roll, and it just hit hard. So look, you, you did right, but you, the advantages you've got, you've got the internet, you've got the bulk of the American populace on your side, You've got an armed citizenry who the federal government is still afraid of. It better be. Yeah, well, it better be, you know. And I'm not advocating any violence. No, I'm I just saying, I'm just it, saying it's it a ought, check and a balance in the ought system. You to remember that. Yeah, it should, and it does. That's why Hillary Clinton is busily trying to get rid of that. But, so you've got these advantages. Really, what you've got to do, the, the first step in front of you is to win this election. Now that doesn't mean I love the Republicans or whatever at all. That means that getting the Democrats out of power gives you some breathing space and a fighting chance. Now if you could then repeal Obamacare and then start getting stuck into the Department of Energy, the Department of Edu Education, the EPA, OSHA and all these other organisations that are grinding your country down, then you can start to restore things. Look, if you started did one thing, if you got rid of Obamacare, sorry? Do you honestly think that these political types are going to do this? Well, did, did, I have did, no faith in them. Well, I had no faith two years ago, that three years ago, that anything like the Tea Party would arrive. It shocked me as much as it shocked the left. And I'm telling you, this is a movement that is shaking this country all over the place. In Texas, in Alabama, in California, your legis the composition of your legislatures is changing. We're you can have people. It. Sorry. We're working on it. You here. are working on it, and you're succeeding. Rome wasn't built in a day. But I look, I, I am blown away. No, but look, if you told me you're going to make this much progress in two years, a bunch of political novices could do this much in two years. If you told me that five years ago, I would have laughed at you. But you've made a huge amount of difference in this country. And you know, you're gonna get, you keep that up, you'll get independent states who basically give the finger to the federal government, who start drilling their own oil and start doing their own stuff. If you got rid of Obamacare and you started drilling your own oil and you're doing your own fracking and whatever, you would turn this economy around very, very quickly. Let alone cutting taxes, let alone getting rid of the EPA, let alone extending right to work to more states. There's a lot of things that can be done, and the state legislatures are going to be one of the key places to do this. And you can't, you might not be able to get rid of the Department of Education straight away, but you can control your local school board and get all the socialist textbooks, textbooks out of your local schools and start putting some good ones in there. So look, I am under no illusions about the challenges that are faced in this country, but I'm also under no illusions on the consequences of losing this battle. You know, it's going to be a we are very much aware of it. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a thousand years dark ages around the corner. We're heading for either a new golden age or a new dark age. And it really depends 
I hate to put a big responsibility trip on you guys, but you guys are at the front line of that battle. So much depends on how America goes. How this country goes, so go the rest of us. So look, look, when you stood up in the American Revolution, you got support. The French came in to help you, and even elements of the British Parliament came in to help you. And when you guys stand up for your constitution, you'll be surprised at how many millions of people all around the world who will stand up with you. The only reason they don't do it now is because they don't see the leadership. They see America going down, and they don't want to put their hand up against their own socialist government, because who's going to help them? But when Americans stand up and start turning their country around, that will spread worldwide, and the old alliances will reforge, and people all around the world will be backing you. So you won't be alone in this struggle, and you're not alone now. So please, you know, it's George Washington, you know, somebody, you know, he won because he was an optimist. He had overwhelming odds against him. And you've got overwhelming odds against you now. But you're guided by a true ideal. You're guided by your constitution and the, and the, and the principles that gave you that constitution. And they didn't come from Islam or Hindu or whatever. You know, so, so there is that element to consider. You know, the miraculous does happen. But it happens to people who are already striving. And you guys are striving. And I think what you've done already is miraculous. So look, I just want to urge you, you know, if you keep the faith and keep going, you will win. You know, so that's my message. And I appreciate where you're coming from, believe me. Believe me. Because I've felt every, I've felt every bit of it, you know. Man. I was going to say, uh, watching my Glenn Beck off his online show, he's yeah. talking about how the European leaders are asking the Craig how to help Glenn Beck help the Craig Girl Tea Party. Yeah, yeah. And tells him, he tells, I forget what he says, I think he says some more lines of that it wasn't created, it wasn't, it wasn't a political party, he didn't create the Tea Party, but it was created amongst people like us. Yeah. He rolls up. Look, look, there are people all over Europe who are looking to America for leadership. There are people in my country who want to do Tea Party type stuff. There's already people in Australia who are doing it. There's people in Britain who are doing it. But it is just, you know, it's just getting off its ground, you know. And, and look, there's people around the world who love what America stands for, and they've been a bit disappointed because America has drifted so far away from that. But when you reassert that, and when you stand boldly for it, you'll be surprised who comes out in support. And it's, it's the majority of people love you. They really do. You know, the majority of people love freedom. They love liberty. It's every country has its nests of leftists who run things, you know. And it's true in my country as well. But you know, America, the American Revolution stabilized and guided the world for 200 years. And now it's faltering, and it has to be re-established and recharged and re-energized, and it can do it again for another thousand years. There's no reason why it can't. And um, you guys are you guys are at the beginning of that. And it's a very exciting thing to watch. It's hard work to be in it. Question. You, know? you were asking a question. Oh, I, I understand there is a, put forth a resolution by Representative Jones in the House. Uh, it's uh, resolution number 107. Impeachment of Obama and the military leadership, yep. or uh, triggered by the Panetta um, oh, the, the, situation, uh, the, saying we, our our allegiance, our dis military decision making will be undertaken by the UN well, and NATO. Exactly. Yeah. Well. And what what uh, strength do you think our Congress has after that extraordinary <laughs> expression of tyranny? Um, do you think that Congress will put this through? Do you think we, they'll find all kinds of excuses to wait till after the election? Look, look, I don't, I don't think they would do it. And um, I'm sort of hoping. Look, look, this is my view, and it might contradict a bit. Like, I agree that Obama should be impeached, and I agree that Panetta should be impeached as well. And I think they should push it. 
but really the main focus has got to be the elections, and then after the elections, you've got to have congressional hearings and senate hearings into people like Obama, into Anita, their backgrounds, and how they got to the positions they did. And I think that's all too much to do between now and then. And so, look, I applaud what he's doing. I applaud flying the flag on it. I doubt that it will get anywhere before the elections, but I'm glad he's raising that flag, and hopefully after the elections it will be carried forward. Um, I just really think, from world public opinion too, Obama's got to be de-elected, and the Democrats have got to be kicked out in a legitimate election to give this whole thing public credibility so that people can't say, oh, this was just a racist coup against Obama, or, you know, the Americans hate black people, or whatever. You know, he's got, to, he's got to go, and a new government's got to come in, and then you guys have got to pressure the new government to get serious about national security. But the new government's going to face huge challenges, because a lot of the enemies of this country have been holding back while, while their man is in the White House. But when their man is out of the White House, they'll have nothing to lose, and there'll be some pretty heavy stuff happening. So it's going to be forced on the new government to take some strong security measures, I think. And you guys, your role is to keep your community strong and keep the pressure on and keep the state houses strong so that the federal government can't boss the states around. And if you have to even secede, you know, in some instances. So, um, yeah, pressure from every front. But I, I just think the crucial thing is a legitimate, a legitimate election which you guys win. With a whole lot more strong Conservatives in the Senate and a whole bunch more in the Congress. You know, you had 30, if you had 20 Jim DeMints in the Senate and 50 Alan West in the Congress, a lot of your problems would be fixed pretty quickly. Can you manufacture them today? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. But look, look, your, your state legislatures, you know, they are a lot more conservative now than they were two years ago. I'll tell you that. You know, no question. So, Except those. <laughs> well, even the Massachusetts one is better. Not much better, but it's better. Start. Yeah, it's well, a start. Along with this whole mess, yeah, yeah. we have to think about um, creeping Sharia yeah. and what's going on in um, Egypt. And how does, does that, how does that feel? Well, look, this is my, this is how I say it. Islam, radical Islam and Islamic terrorism has always worked with the left for 50 years. They're like that. They're two arms of the same octopus. You know, we, we know that the communists infiltrated the Christian churches a long time ago. They also infiltrated the Islamic seminaries as well. Look, the Taliban in Afghanistan, they're as much Maoist as they are, Mar as they are Muslim. You know, the number two, in, in, um, the number two man in Al-Qaeda was trained by the KGB. al Zahawi, or whatever his name is. So, so that is why in this country the ACLU and all the leftist groups are empowering at every opportunity the Muslim radicals. But if you try and put a nativity scene up in your local council building, They'll, they'll be on your case, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll stop you. So the left, left is, the, the radical Islamic thing, the creeping Sharia, is empowered by the left at every opportunity because thine enemy's enemy is thy friend. They know these guys hate you, so they help them to hate you, to destroy you. So really, they are, they are they're two branches of the same movement. And if you could disempower the left, you will be able to knock back the spread of Sharia and all these unconstitutional, you know, I've got nothing against Muslims if they just live in their own communities and do their own thing, that's fine. My cousin is a Muslim convert and she's perfectly harmless. But um, it's cultural, it's, it's, it's cultural Islam guided by Marxism, that is the threat, you know, and that's got to be fought, it's got to be understood as a branch of the left. And even though they hate gays and suppress women, they still, the radical left will still work with them at every opportunity. 
So it's, 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 a, it's a united front. We have to fight both, both at once. One more question, guys. Trevor, have you sent a copy of your book to Tom Brokaw or Tar Charlie Rose? <laughs> no, no. I, it's gone all over the place. I don't know where it, it's it's gone everywhere, but I, I not to those specific guys that I can think of. How about so, left wing Bill O'Reilly? Left is Bill O'Reilly. Oh, look, look, Glenn Beck's got it. I know some of the other top journalists have got it. Look, I've a lot of my stuff's been quoted in other books as well, so, um, and I know that there are films coming out this year on Obama that are going to deal with some of the aspects of what I'm talking about, and, and the late great Andrew Breitbart's websites are also going to be exposing a lot of this stuff. Um, so I think, like, like Andrew Breitbart, some of the stuff's already been talking about, well, there, was a, there was a big article in National Review, uh, not in National Review, the American Spectator, which quoted a lot of my stuff on David Axelrod and his mentors, Cantor, Rose, etc. So this stuff's getting out there and it will be out there this year. You know, just as Frank Marshall Davis is common knowledge now and Van Jones is common knowledge, Alice Palmer and David a and, and Don Rose and David Cantor will also become common knowledge. And this man is not going to be able to get away with the scam he got away with last time. Of course, the AP is what? Axelrod Productions? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, so what I've been doing is going around the states. I've been to a whole lot of meetings in Florida and um, New Jersey and um, Connecticut. I'm going to Colorado next. I'm speaking to a big conservative conference in Utah. I'm going to address the tax party's big meeting in Orlando on April 15th, which is about 3,000 people. So, you know, I'm speaking to audiences from 10 to 1,500 to a couple of thousand all around this country and I'm going to be doing it for three months. Then I'm going back home so I remember what it looks like and then I'm going to come back here for another three months later on in the year and go around again. And uh, so it's, it's, you know, I just consider that this is the big year. This is the year so much depends on. And, you know, I've got to put something, just, as we all are here, you know, we're all putting everything we can into this year because if we do that we have a chance of turning things around and if we don't my immigration consultancy to New Zealand will boom for about two <laughs> years until the Chinese come and take us over so um, yeah I just want to say thank you all you know for having me here tonight and uh, thanks for listening and um, just keep on doing what you're doing and everybody get out there and get another friend along as well, you know. Just keep on doubling that movement and increasing that movement and you'll see what an amazing impact you can have this year. So thank you very much, guys. So, uh, we do plan to have him back again, this time with more notice to everyone. And we hope to actually have multiple locations just as we did right now, even though we actually summed this up at short notice. Uh, and hey, yeah. so I think there's two books left. Uh, yeah, are they all gone? Or, 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 yeah. So you want one, then, Sheila? Do you want one? Okay. okay, so and I'll take one. the last one because I yeah. nobody else wants one, right? I've got one already. Okay, yeah, he's got one. All right, so yeah, so all done now. So he's got one. So I don't want to carry any more of my baggage. So that's, that's <laughs> no, that's it. They're all gone. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And now the last joke before you leave. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I think of a joke. Who knows Tom Jones songs? You know Tom Jones? Yeah. Okay, a guy goes into a, a guy goes into a psychiatrist's office and says, Doc, Doctor, look, I, I can't stop singing Green, Green Grass of Home. Everywhere I go, Green, Green Grass of Home. I can't stop Green, Green Grass of Home. The doctor says, I know what you've got. You've got Tom Jones syndrome. He says, oh, well, well, is, is, is it common? The doctor says, it's not unusual. <laughs>
don't you? Instead of garden walks and ball games, I get to work my weekends too. How could I live without my LinkedIn? Lucky, lucky, lucky me. 